reason why we were particularly appreciative of working with Goldsmiths is that our mission is to prepare evidence-based policy recommendations for improving lifelong learning. And our focus is more creative activities in the learning process, whether it's for innovation, entrepreneurship, finance, logistics, to engage, motivate the professionals. And most of our partners are coming from business schools. And consequently, having a different perspective yeah. from the creative industries and that merger that's taking place. And I'd love to hear, you've come out of, I believe, BBC, out of the private sector. Yeah. What Any is private. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> but from your experience in the semi-private industry and working with a lot of private companies, large British companies and such, and now you're in higher education. Is there room for a university cluster as the core of our economic development going forward? Is there a role for universities? Universities are utterly critical to an evolving future for industry generally, and particularly maybe so for the creative industries. We have an extraordinary history in this place of individual genius that transformed how we live. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock was here exactly a century ago. Mary Quant was here, Vivian Westwood was here, Damien Hirst, Anthony Gormley. Now, I cite these individual names as if they were somehow islands of creativity. They, it is true that individually they changed how we dress, how we think of ourselves, our image of, of contemporary Britain and hence contemporary Europe and arguably the world, but it's a bit more complex than that. Uh, they also were at the forefront, I mean, for Hitchcock, played a huge part in creating the British film industry. Mary Quant and Vivian Westwood, two women pioneers, critically, created contemporary British fashion industry employ countless people. So I use those, and the YBAs, the British art movement, largely this is their home. Uh, well, the amount of wealth they have generated, not just for themselves, but for this economy, critical. Right. When we cite individuals, you get a misleading impression that they are somehow isolated. There is a very supportive, creative, pedagogic culture that nurtures and supports them. And the myth of the heroic individual is misleading. They emerge from a very thoughtful, supportive group culture that gives them license to be remarkable individuals. But they depend on remarkable teachers, a remarkable supportive ecology that makes their individualism possible. So I do believe that universities are fundamental. What, what role does diversity play in teams? Diversity is said to be both an asset, where you're looking at different disciplines, socioeconomic background, ethnic, cultural backgrounds, but it's also a tremendous challenge to get effective collaboration in diverse teams. Sure, sure. And it's harder. You've been working at Goldsmiths coming out of the cultural industries and you have had some tremendous lifelong learning programs that you've been doing with main, what I'll call mainstream businesses yep. that are not necessarily cultural industry. Um, coming out of business and spending time, rather more time than I would have chosen in boardrooms, the single biggest problem is cloning. Groups of people who choose people just like them to join them. Mm. And I would argue that a big part of the banking crisis we've just gone through, in fact, I wish we were through it, which we are still going <laughs> through, okay. is because okay. of cloned attitudes, cloned values, cloned thinking. Yes, it makes it easier because the chaps all agree. They come from exactly the same backgrounds with exactly the same value system or absence of value system sometimes. 
there is no debate. There's consensus. Now, you get short-term gain from consensus mm -hmm. and long-term, not pain, but agony. Diversity is harder. Diversity of gender, diversity of culture, diversity of language. But, oh my word, it's so much richer. You emerge from that creative tension, that debate, that difference, with something forged with solidity and meaning. 137 nationalities in Goldsmiths. We represent a very wide spectrum of contemporary Asia, contemporary Europe, and now I'm pleased to say Latin America more and more so. That really, really brings a great vein of diverse values, perspective, and it's so important that we do not bring them here to... Can we, can we not do the sound check, please? We're interviewing. Thank you. It's, that brings something utterly unpredictable. And it's so important that we don't bring them here, sorry, to homogenize them into some goldsmith's way of doing things. We learn as much as they learn. They bring as much as we bring to them. Pursuing this a little bit, you have been rated as number one in the United Kingdom for sociology. You have tremendous reputation in the cultural industry. What is your recommendation for improving lifelong learning for the European Commission? So looking at the local institutional level, what else would you do? At the national level, UK, and then at the EU level, if you had a few key recommendations, what would they be? I wish I had more time to ponder this, but off the cuff, without mm. long reflection. When I came here, I, I'm long before me, but I, I detected when I came some invidious choice in the minds of many between research on the one hand and teaching on the other hand. And as if they were somehow separate, somehow unrelated. My glib response, if, there, if I had venture capital in this field, I would commission serious pedagogic research to explore innovation, to assess it, and to explain differences and benefits of styles, techniques, and learning models. You know, it's almost a, a, a conscious bridge between the research culture and the pedagogic culture to demonstrate that they are ultimately one, but also for us to know, to learn more from best practice. Now, what I found very interesting, and we'll be picking up on this tomorrow, is you would say, you said that you would reach out to venture capital and perhaps angel investors, wealthy individuals who have created their own wealth through their entrepreneurship. You did not mention <coughs> European funding. This college benefits disproportionately from European funding. Okay. We, we absolutely do. Mm -hmm. It's there, but I, well, I take a I'll give you a different... I, I would certainly be, be polite and diplomatic. But I, 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 would, I, would, I would go more broadly than that for funding right. support for this. For about eight years, I was a member of the board and chairman of the board of the British Teaching Awards, which celebrates great achievement in the classrooms across the UK. Mm -hmm. We had some of the most spectacular celebrity endorsements for that. Every eminent person in British public life, from movie stars to prime ministers, wished to give testimonials to the single teacher or two who changed their lives by their pedagogic practice or by their value system and who they were. From that experience, I can tell you that there is not a wealthy individual, there is not the leader of a trust fund who does not know that much of their success came from the support, the ingenuity of great teachers. Mm -hmm. And it's to tap that reservoir of goodwill mm -hmm. and to allow them to share some of their good fortune with generations to follow. That, that. As kind of a final question, Reseba under Eating's leadership, Boris's leadership, some years ago decided 
to move from primarily a economics and business college over into architecture, audiovisual media, sociology, business psychology, and so it's business meets the art. We're still a very small university. We're growing. That's quite ambitious. <laughs> you need the vision and the ambition. Without that, you have nothing. What words of advice would you have for other small, ambitious universities that want to move in a more modern such big questions. Such yes. Big questions. Um, do relatively few things relatively well. I think Goldsmiths is very, very strong because of its focus. We are about the creative industries, social sciences, and fine arts. If we had dentistry, veterinary, engineering, medicine and law, it would be so much harder to maintain an individual distinctiveness and culture. Uh, there's a definition of strategy. It's, the strategy is what you decide not to do. And I think most small enterprises, it's not a lack of ambition. It's yeah, be no, really, yes, yeah, really yeah, yeah, very yeah, ambitious. Yeah, yeah. But be very ambitious with the focus. Don't open the lens too wide. If the lens is too wide, it is spectacularly difficult to be excellent in three things simultaneously. Very good. Mind, yeah. Do you have one or two questions you'd like to ask? Uh, institutionally, for me currently, mm -hmm. the biggest challenge is in the framework of the concept of business meets mm -hmm. arts, to make sure that people from different departments really interact. People from business departments interact with audiovisual people, with people from architecture. And making sure that also people from different disciplines work together in joint programs. How do you solve this issue? I'm not, sure we, well, I'm not sure we do. I mean, I'm honestly not sure we do. My predecessor said Goldsmiths was the most interdisciplinary place he'd ever been. But all the interdisciplinarity happened within departments. Yes. Okay. One answer of the moment, which is, is working, research bids. When people work together to build a funding application to make a bid to Europe or elsewhere for a resource, they are obliged now to work in a more interdisciplinary way. If they're successful, you've created a whole new entity. So it's almost create challenges that are not sectional. There's an influence <coughs> in academic life. There really is still. Interdisciplinarity is very, very desirable, but we talk interdisciplinarity, but we tend to reward within the disciplines. But you're published right. within disciplines. You get chairs within disciplines. Everything that we drives... Get assessed within disciplines. Within so disciplines you've got well. to recognize yeah. that. There, there's no point in pretending that isn't a real gravitational exactly. field. But I, I find that the postgraduate research projects are the most potent bridges between groups that we've got. Mm. So think it, yeah. it isn't easy and yeah. please don't think that it can be solved. You cannot solve it with one in, within an institution. Because in, for me the academy Scholars live here, but they belong to their disciplines. They belong to the field in which they work. And they feel as much part of the anthropologists of the world, all 800 of them, as they do to any one institution. You cannot therefore blur the edges of their vocation. Hmm. Peter. Peter Kelly from Alto University. I've met Peter before. In Trinity ah, Trinity, yeah, Trinity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Peter on two European projects at this point, developing a number of very innovative approaches to finance, supply chain management, things that students typically avoid. Getting at the essence of what is the thought, what are the concepts, not number crunching. Yep. Peter, what question would you have? 
Uh, you notice we, we, have, we, we, notice we, have, have, we have him boxed in up against no. the wall with four people around him. Not so much as a question as opposed to a comment. And if this actually goes live, then I'm going to have a big explanation to my No, boss. this is not live. Because Alto's motto is where technology, science, and business meet the arts. And it's not meeting. These need to collide at a much in a much more intensive way. And this is the most interesting teaching I do is when I have a mixture of people sitting in my classroom looking at problems or challenges, very messy ones, from very many different, different angles. Different sides of the brain. And, and I think what I've discovered, and, and I had the great pleasure of meeting the Goldsmiths people in Dublin, and Dublin had me over to assess their innovation entrepreneurship strategy. It was a committee. It was a committee document, and that gets you nowhere. Um, and they chose a focal point with one little bit of the university working with Goldsmiths. And the, the message I gave them is you have to have the right habitat. And this is one thing that design schools, particularly when you walk in, are, they just embrace an intuitive thinking and outside of the committee room type of approach. One, and two, the process by which people in these disciplines get educated is fundamentally different than business students or engineers. Oh, yeah. You have to come with a portfolio. And there's a depth and, and a an inner drive and fire in schools like Goldsmiths that I do not see in our school of engineering. That's not a bad thing to say that you know somebody being a good engineer, it's not the same thing to fill in an application to get an engineering school as it is to put a portfolio to get one of these cherished places at some of these small I, schools. I completely agree with you, Peter, and I'm not sure I could entirely analyze why it's the case. But if you are a small entrepreneur going into our Institute for Creative and Cultural Entrepreneurship or Management School. That is so much about you. Your yeah. idea, your project is you. It's like a oh, you know, creative institution. It is so like your poetry or your singing or your artwork. Mm. It's a deep expression of your values, your ambitions and your hopes. Mm. That's not like a calculation in a business school. No, it is. I've, I, I spent a lot of my life in business schools. They, they are different places, shared, you know, bond by an ambition, usually to get rich. No. Mm. Uh, that, if you're in the cultural industries or have a passion for content, yes, you would like to be rich, you would like to profit from your skills, but that's not the core purpose. That's not the reason that and therefore they do hold them more dear and they are probably ultimately more vocational. One of there the are problems with that as well mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. are they willing to, how, fle how flexible or dexterous are they when they hold them so dear? Yes. Well, one, one of the interesting insights from some National Science Foundation support in the States, they took students in their 20s who had failed physics, mathematics in high school, put them into a community college, and they used practical work with them. Huh. And these are kids, mm -hmm. students, who liked working with motors, they had the engine, they had the portfolio, they didn't have the skills. Their minds were not wired to look at equations, memorize them. When they gave real life situations, here's a room, rewire it, follow code, they, they suddenly them. learned it. Those students, after two years, performed better and excelled over the four-year engineering students at the University of North Carolina. Portfolio would be a wonderful yeah. way of admitting people. Yeah. Yeah. We, we do that in design, art, and music. But believe me, the pressures are the other way. The pressures are for traditional qualifications. But then we have to go frankly, searching the planet for people who have the portfolio and the qualifications, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Unfor good. Unfortunately, it, it's difficult. I've, I've put some students into Cambridge who were the entrepreneurs, they had the passion, but they didn't necessarily have the discipline or all the academic skills. Half of them blossomed, did very well. Half of them simply could not get up to that level. Right. It really is. And there are so many incredibly successful entrepreneurs who had every form of educational problem. Branson's dyslexia yeah. and all yes. of that. I mean, yes. We need to be humble in, in universities. Universities are central and they're, they're 
core to a lot of industrial development, but they're not a prerequisite. There are many other avenues oh, into this field if, as well. You know, James Dyson failed 5,127 times with the vacuum cleaner. The question I'd ask somebody like Pat is, would you hire him? Would you hire him to teach? Steve, Steve, <laughs> Job, Steve Jobs was a 1980s hippie from a middle class and never went to college, and he has transformed the world. Mm -hmm. And if you looked at the photographs of him those days, you, you would never hire him. Most of our people would say, oh, hippie, blah, 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 don't hire him. Why do we, as you said earlier, why do we have to clone ourselves? Why do we have to look for people with ties and all that? I, I, Goldsmith, on the, in its, at its very best, Goldsmith probably has more Dysons and Jobs than guys with ties. To yeah. be fair. Oh, I, I this is a home of dissidents and <laughs> and radical thinking. But we, but part of, part of the toolkit is humility as well. Mm -hmm. We have there is no one avenue to to creative success.